You know, hello, 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 all the fans around the world. And we're doing it special, special with a pre-Thanksgiving Eve. You know, all of you know how important Thanksgiving is to the Americas, right? It's a time when we give thanks, where we try to give thanks for all that we have. I don't want to talk about the political side of Thanksgiving, but I'm just to say the, the, the religious side. Let's just give thanks that we're all here, alive. We've lost a lot of people along the way. It's never easy. COVID's never been something that we all predicted, but we've learned to deal with, right? And I want to say I'm sorry for being a little late. But I was talking to my man, Eric, on the sidelines, and I was like, damn, I forgot to get the pictures up. So we finally got the pictures up, but I'm glad you're all tuning in because today is going to be one of those moments, again, where we have truth come out, okay? And welcome to True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City on a pre-Thanksgiving Eve, and we are Setting our sights to Washington, D.C. I love dance music. I love R&B. I love me some funk. I love me some go-go music. But I got to tell you, I played in Washington, D.C. I played at tracks and some other clubs through the years. But I met this brother that has become a friend of mine for a long time through another Chicago brother, Byron Stingley. And back in the day when I met him and he told me his story, I never forgot about it. You know, it was one of those stories because we all know the people behind it. And today we're welcoming Mr. Eric Dahl. And I'll tell you who he is. He's a music producer, a DJ, okay, musical director, worked with many, many people, wrote many songs. And of course, we're going to go over all that. Worked alongside another legend who is no longer with us, Vaughn Mason. And there's a whole story that goes to Vaughn Mason, too. Those who remember Bounce Skate, Roll Rock, right? That disco skating is the way disco moves, all those words and all that stuff that was going on back then on Burnswick Records. But he was telling me on the sidelines, his lineage goes back to the early 80s. So without further ado, let's get right up in the show. I'd like to welcome Thanksgiving special, Eric. Ah. Hey, how you doing, Lenny? I'm good. Right out of the UK, right? You you live simulcasting out of the United Kingdom. Yeah, I've been over here for about almost 30 years. He's there. He's a DC boy, and he is living up in UK. Eric, I hope you're well. Everything. Do you miss before we get into the show? Do you miss those American customs living over there? And you miss like Thanksgiving and stuff? Yeah, I, I do miss uh having that Thanksgiving dinner, but having been over here so long, I mean, for the better part of 30 years, you know, it just sort of kind of fades somewhat, you know what I mean? Like, um, you know, Columbus Day, Thanksgiving Day, Veterans Day, these certain days, they don't um, reverberate over here, but they still do have holidays. They just call it a bank holiday. So basically it, it coincides with some of the American holidays, not all of them, but it's a bank holiday. But now, tomorrow, is just a normal day here. I know. So, you know, but I, I, have, I have had s- several Thanksgiving dinners made for me, you know, since I've been here. But, you know, I mean, they don't they don't um, celebrate here. So it is what it is. I know, I know. But, hey, we're going to wish you a happy Thanksgiving because we know deep in your bloodline, America flows real deep inside inside you. Well, so as you know, I ran into Eric at Ministry of Sound when Spen, DJ Spen was having his 10 year anniversary and we reconnected again. And he was like, I love what you're doing with the show. I love to come on. I was like, bet we got a date quick, right? And we locked the date down fast. I said, I'm getting you back. I'm getting you on the show because you know what happens with all of us out of sight for a minute, not out of mind, just out of sight because we somehow we're all five degrees of separation in this game. Like, you know, I maybe work on a record. You'll be like you later on, yo, I did that on the record. And that's what we're going to get into the story of how things intertwine with how your life rolled out from the beginning of your career. So 
Let's get to that question. How does music oh. find a young Eric, the kid? The kid or the music finds you or you find the music? Um, I think I was born into it because my father was a musician. He um he graduated from the Howard University School of Music, and he was also in the house band of this place called the Howard Theater. Howard Theater is where the Motown acts and those people would come to. So he used to back up some of them. And then um, other people he played with, Aretha Franklin, Temptations. Uh, um, my mother would tell me that Charlie Parker would come and knock on our door to borrow my father's horn because he pawned his horn. So music, I guess, was, you know, I was born into that. And my, my big sister, Filipina Flowers Bishop. She's married to Bob Bishop, who was the sound engineer for Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton, and Bootsy for 17 years. So the music was always around. So I have to mute sometimes because we get that delay. But so take us from the point. So now Bishop and of course Funkadelic. And I know musical training. Do you have? Formal musical training? Yeah. Yes. I played the clarinet for about eight years. My father was really stringent about uh, me doing music because, I mean, his major instrument was the, was the woodwinds, you know, saxophone, clarinet, and flute. So I played that clarinet for eight years in the school band, and I had to come home every day, and I had to rehearse for two hours and everything, and I really didn't like that clarinet. It really was a... Uh, it really was just not what I wanted to do. Hey, you something. Did he play you Benny Goodman? Let me and Benny Goodman make sure. Oh, that's funny you say that. That's funny because uh, him and my father, they was friends in college. Yeah, Benny Goodman. So what happened was um, after that eight years, I sort of just, just, just came away from wanting to play that clarinet. We had a Hammond organ, a piano in our house, and I started noodling around on those things. And my father was like, um, you know, you're just wasting your time there. You know, I don't know what you're doing, you know, playing by ear and, you know, picking out these songs. You know what I mean? If you do what I tell you to do, you will really go far. And he was just really kind of like iron fist with that. So he kind of just put me off to the point where, you know what I mean? We just sort of like kind of went in, in different directions. You know what I mean? The, the more that I wouldn't play the clarinet and read the music anymore is the the further that he was just like, okay, you know what? Okay, that's what you want to do. I'm trying to help you, but okay, that's that. So I would play the piano, play the organ, play stuff. And um, I have friends of mine in the neighborhood who played um, in bands, you know, um, and they ended up becoming members of Gil Scott Heron's band. So um, I would keep in contact with them and eventually I got to meet Gil. And eventually I got to work for Gil. Tell us what that was like, brother. Come on now. Well, that was an experience. I mean, it just caught me, caught me off guard, you know, because um, Gil had finished doing a concert and he came up to me and he said, um, um, I like the way that you're always in communication with the band every time we're in town. And he says, I'm ready to go on a European tour and I could use some help. If you're interested, get me your passport, you know, right away. And I was like, I mean, I, I just said yes to him and everything like that. But after I walked away from him, I was just like, what? Going to Europe? What? Pass what? So I went and got the passport, gave it to him and everything. And um, June 1985, that was the date. Caught that plane and uh, out of Dulles Airport and flew into Gatwick. And that's when I believed it was really happening, when I was on the plane. Because honestly, um, we went to the airport the first day and uh, Gil didn't show, so we didn't go nowhere. So I was like, okay, came back home. My mother was like, look, you know, if this thing doesn't happen, just, you know, just, just don't, don't let it, you know, go to your head or really, because things happen. Then the next day, we went to the airport and we got on the plane. So once the plane took off, I was like, yes, it is happening. Arrived in London. Uh, I think we had 10 shows. 
up and down, and we played the Hacienda, which which would become very pivotal later on, right? Yes, definitely. Hacienda. Play Ronnie Scott. But Joe's band, what were you playing? I wasn't playing anything. I was his road manager and his yeah, personal you clear, assistant. Want you clear that up. Yeah, why don't you explain that? Yeah. I was his road manager, personal assistant. You know, I would pay the band. I would, um, you know, uh, keep him up on his interviews and things he has to do. Uh, wardrobe, I would dress him because we were about the same size, whatever. So I'd make sure he looked kind of tidy like that. And I did that for like about mm, for a few years. Yeah, that was probably my most important job in the music industry. Working for him. Okay. So you, you got, well, that's like the kill score. I call it kill scout hair and education because you must have got educated real fast. Yeah, I did. The stuff he, he, he was really, um, really on it. Okay. There, there wasn't no left or right, there was only straight. And if you weren't going with him, then you just weren't going with him. You know, he's going to walk over you or, or, or leave you behind. If you didn't get on the train, that was it. So, yeah, I did learn a lot from Gil. And um, that's how I got to London. That was my first time going to London was in 85. So you were already now in London, but we spoke before. Let's talk about early 80s. Real, as you starting to come up in writing and, and you're involved. Okay. In, take okay, that, that would have been, yep, in the early 80s. I'm playing that piano. You know, I'm hearing songs on the radio that, that I like. So I would hammer them out to the point where, yep, I'm playing that bass line. Yep, I'm playing these chords. Yep, I'm playing these these top lines. You know what I mean? And it might not have been the original key and chords that the song was in, but it was still the song, if you know what I mean? Whereas you would recognize it, okay? So you'd be like, okay, yeah, okay. It might not have been A minor, C flat, this and that, but it was still the song. So um, I was heavily influenced by funk, okay? The first two 45s that I ever bought was uh, James Brown Hot Pants and Gil Scott Heron, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. And little did I know that later on in life that I would meet both of them. Because I met James Brown one time. Um, it was a black music conference tribute to him at the Washington Convention Center featuring Paul McFunkadelic and Eddie Murphy. So me hanging with my sister hanging with Funkadelic, I got on this elevator and when I turned around, it was James Brown and his wife. So I was like, uh, how you doing, Mr. Brown? You know, pleasure to meet you and whatever. I was like hyped when I got off the elevator. I said, I haven't met James Brown. Anyway, so I wanted to, you know, write, do funk music, you know, like, um, like a lot of the guys that I knew in Funkadelic. A lot of them are gone there, the guys that I know, they're past normal. But I, I wanted to be that way, you know? Um, so I, so I'll go to the studio. Oh, why? Why did you want to go that way? What were the, the you got to describe the times so people understand because let me just give you a reason why I say that. When I was coming up, DJs like Larry Levan and were making big things happen in nightclubs and you're watching all the superstars. What was going on around that funk scene that was driving you there? Bootsy in the end, Bootsy became to be bigger than all of them. He was he he was a um a, a, a side act or, or a subsidiary act in the beginning because it started off being Parliament and Funkadelic. And then, you know, they had plenty of other offshoots, you know, plenty of them. But Boosie, he became the biggest one out of all of it. And um they would come to my sister's apartment, to my sister's apartment in DC, and they would come there, some of them, and I'm sitting there looking at them and sitting there and, and just taking it in. I was just really really nerdy compared to how they was, because they were some rock and rollers, boy. They were coming in there with their, with their this and that and everything. And I'm just sitting there watching it. So we're really talking about right in 80 and 81, One Nation Under a Groove. I really did like that song. So, and I also did like Michael Henderson's Wide Receiver. And I sort of like made a sort of um, variation between the two of those bass lines somewhat and went to this demo studio um, that I um, did the song in and then took it back to a couple of the guys on Funkadelic because I, I wanted somebody to say, it's good, it's bad, it's nothing. So, hang on, hang on. So at the, at the studio, this is 1980-ish, right? 
Yeah, 81. Did you, to, did you have to assemble a band? Or was it, you know, I'm going to play, like, I don't understand anything about the music industry. Did you have to assemble the band, or was there a computer operation there at that time? That was before computers. No, what it was, um, the guy named John Freeman, okay, John C. Freeman, he's the guy that wrote, co-wrote, I Just Don't Want to Be Lonely, the main ingredient. Okay, so it was he was the uh, the, the CEO of the studio, and he liked he, he took a liking to me, and um, my father was was the strict type that if you didn't write it down on notes and paper and in the bass clef and the treble clef, you ain't done nothing. John actually showed me that you can compose a song by recording your idea and just modulating that over time, but in the most raw form, you have composed music. So he encouraged me, and out of that came this groove that I did in the studio, um, and he would engineer for me. So, okay, I played the drums, I played uh, keyboard bass, I think on a Fender Rhodes, I think, that's what was there. And um, another guy played guitar, and that was pretty much uh, the rhythm. I put some strings on it, a couple of things like that. That was my first time ever recording. I played, you know, played them, but actually recording. So I took it back to the um, to the guys at um, Funkadelic, and they were like, yeah, it's, it's not too bad, and whatever. So I'm like, okay. Well, I was hyped. I'm like, for them to say anything encouraging, you know, being who they was, I was like, okay, well, I, I'm starting to go on the right track. So um, that song was playing around down at the attic, at the studio. Um, there's a guy named Butch Dale. And Butch Dale was a drummer already in Bon Mason and crew. And he wanted to do um, a solo project and things like that. So he heard that song in that demo form and he really liked it. And um, he took it to Vaughn and Vaughn doesn't sing. So they worked out a deal where they would do where they would do the song, and he's gonna he, he's the vocalist because he actually co-wrote it, and Jerome Bell co-wrote, and and Bond's name went down for co-writing, but he didn't write anything on it for say. But basically, this is how it went down. And also, there was another guy coming down that studio who was looking for tracks for people. His name was Leroy Johnson. Leroy Johnson is Rick James' brother, manager. Okay, he he created the Mary Jane Girls. He'd done all the legal stuff and management stuff for Rick for all that time. He wanted the song for me. He offered me 50% publishing and writers right off of the top if I gave him this song. And me, I was green as a blade of grass, and I just wanted to stay loyal to the people that I was with, which was John Freeman, you know, Butch Deo, and, and, and the people down there. So, um... He, he respected me for that because we're still friends right now, you know, and um, the song came out eventually. You can do it on South Soul Records, which day when Vaughn Mason, you can do it. I remember. So, yeah. so the first song that I really attempted to even write became a, a record. So I was really excited about that. I bet you were, especially coming from. With, you know, they say pulling it from the ether because you're writing it, you're learning the studio, you're learning this whole new thing. You want, you had, of course, you have musical talent. That's besides the point. You come from great lineage, but now you're getting the electronic formula. Who did the work on the project when you handed the song over? Did Vaughn and them do that, or were you part of that as well on that record? No, I got to be part of that as well. Okay. Of course, everyone's going to put their own little feeling and touch on the song. But no, I actually, I actually played piano and clavinet on the actual track. But now they had, they got another guy in named Louis Oxley who played the bass, bass synth. And he played it better than I could ever play it because, I mean, he was a guy who had already been playing with Jocelyn Brown, Evelyn Champagne King, the Reddings, um, Tyrone Brunson. He's a man that's already used to playing on hit records. So um, I was a little disappointed that I didn't get to play the bass, but I understood the bigger picture, you know, eventually. But yeah, I got to play 
on, on, on actual final recordings, two of them. So I was happy again. Damn, boy. Talk about some dope lineage, man. That's some hot. I mean, you're, you're playing with like heavy, heavy guys. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing it in, in the background, learning and trying to trying to hold my own. And, and trying to act like you know everything, because that's how it was back. You got to act like you knew. They've been telling you something, going, mm-hmm. and you're yeah. saying to yourself, "What the hell are they talking about?" But you have to kind of lay. There was no like everyone. There was no Google to go Google this. You um, guys, you had a jive right, basically. You had to know how to jive, right? There was nothing. It was hit or miss in that point. They don't, and they didn't give you that much time. It wasn't no computer, so if, if you didn't play something they like in that first, in that first take, that's it. They get somebody else. All right. So keep on going. So how? So now you get your what I call your one-on-one of the business with South Soul Records and Born Mason. You're dealing with some serious stuff right there. All of it, mm-hmm. one time. Yeah, yeah. It, it, James' it, brother, you're dealing with everybody. Yeah, it, it was, it was, um, it, it was a good time, you know I mean? That's, that's, that's where I met, in that same studio, the Attic Studio, that's where I met Vaughn, and that's where I met Gil. So that, that place was really synonymous for, for getting me a start. So after that, You Can Do It comes out. It does kind of all right. And there's another song on that, on that album called Roll Along Songs. And that was just an album track. It became like a cult, a cult thing over time. But um, then I was invited to come up to East Orange, New Jersey, Vaughn Studio. So while I was up there, Vaughn had the 808, he had a Lindrum. I mean, he pretty much had, you know, what was out at the time. Prophet 5 synthesizers, you know, DX7s, you know. So you went to his place. He had those Yuri Timeline monitors. They look something like the ones you got back there, you know, something like that. And Yuri Timeline monitors. So Vaughn was very technical and very good at that. So they were doing different projects, him and Butch. Him and Bush Dale were pretty much doing a, um, a lot of other little side projects, and I was playing keyboards on on them. You know, some keyboards on them. Um, there was a song. There was a, there was the, the track "Don't Make Me Wait." That was from Butch and Robin. That was on Grove Street Records. I played keyboards on that. That got licensed to ZYX. Um, also, a "Let It Move You" track that featured on hip hop rap stars, a ZYX compilation that had MC Hammer, LL Cool J, um, Vanilla Ice, um, you know, Richard Dimples Fields, and you know, quite a few other people on that. And that did pretty well. And I didn't even know about that, but Vaughn had just licensed that to, to ZYX and kind of like didn't tell me about that. So, okay, you know, but, um, you know, Vaughn was like that sometimes, you know, he just, he just uh, did what he did. But, in the studio there, my contributions were used. And I was sort of like, yeah, I was the low man of totem pole. Because you had Vaughn, and you had Butch, then you had me. There was only three of us there. And several times they've gone off to uh to meet the Carey brothers, South Soul, you know, in New York, and left me in the studio to say, we'll be back, we gotta go take care of some business. So I'm just left in the studio and I'm just I'm happy with that as well. I'm, now I can actually just do what I want to do. You know what I mean? And then when so, they were coming back. Eric, were you guys also self-engineering everything as well? All those records we heard, were they all done with you guys together? Or was it somebody who was yeah, they, were, they were done with, with us together. Bond did all the engineering, all the, the mixing, all the mastering. Bond was fantastic at that. Okay. Come down to producing the record. And mixing it and recording it, yes, he was just excellent at that. So that was just me, Vaughn and Butch, and whoever else might have been, you know, inclusive in it, you know, guitar player or singers, whatever. So that's really where I got my my start from really writing things and, and doing doing music with, with Vaughn for for a good few years. Then in 1986. A guy named Vero Vayner, this young guy, he would come down in Vaughn's place. 
and Vaughn had just purchased the the Roland 727. I think it was the Latin percussion machine. So he synced those up, the 808 with the 727, and Vero Vano got down there and programming all this stuff and playing all this stuff up in there. And all you can just hear is a whole bunch of stuff. And then Vaughn came along and took the Samande bass line and just put that on there. And because at that time, everything was talking about some Jack, 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 Steve Silk Hurley and everything out of Chicago. Was just, it was just Jack, Jack this, Jack that, the house that Jack built, just that. So Vaughn just said, Jack the Groove. He didn't even think about it. He just said Jack the Groove and he sampled that. And that became Jack the Groove. Champion Records licensed that. And it became a top 20 UK hit. Matter of fact, it was the second or third house music record to hit the UK pop chart. Steve Silk Hurley was first. And perhaps Daryl Pandy, Don't Turn Around. Was That's right. Second. Don't Turn Around was right after that. Yep. And then Jack the Groove came. So... With the, I, with the, I, I didn't admit, though, because I was... Do, 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 that, that bass line, right? Do, do, do. Yep, that's the mandate bass line with all oh. those yep. multi-layered Latin percussion rolls and whistles and bells and all that, and people love that. So um, I'm in the studio just messing around, doing some other things, and 1986, I went back to London. So while I was there in London, um, I messed around musically trying to find myself and, you know, just trying to get into things. And I had a friend of mine named Ash, who was a manager of a music shop, Rod Argent's music shop down there on um, Tin Pan Alley and in London, central London. And he let me come in the studio. Oh, no, sorry. He let me come into the music shop after hours. But in there as well, they had all the recording equipment, the keyboards, the drum machines, the SPX, emulators, band like that, all that stuff. So I was like, well, look, um, let me get a box of floppy disks. I think I bought 20 floppy disks for about 10 pounds, 12 pounds. And I sampled everything in there that, that enters my ear, you know, drum sound, vocal sound, just you name it. Off of the Fairlight, off of the Prophet 5, off of the Saint Clavier, off of just anything that is made 100 samples um some months later i went back to the united states and then went, went up to vaughn's studio and vaughn had a insonic a rack mount insonic keyboard that was probably, probably the most affordable sample keyboard out of all of them i think that cost about 1500 and i had all those samples formatted so i could go back and, and put them into his machine so I start playing these samples across the keyboard, you know, just, just that that ITN news, Little Richard, bop, bop, baloo, bop, all kind of stuff. <gasps> start hearing this, and then Vaughn was like, oh, oh, let's go back to that. What was that? <gasps> oh, I really like that. That that kind of arouses me. Um, maybe if if we put that in a club record, that it, maybe something might can happen with that. He said, play that again. And he really liked that. So, um, you know, we just sort of do left you remember, it. Do you remember where you got that from? Where you sampled that from? The, the oh, ah, so does the female. You know what? I, I, I sampled, yeah, I sampled, I sampled it at the, um, at Rod Artist Music Shop. But a couple of those samples that I found out later came from um, um, this movie called Airplane or something or whatever. That, that this, uh, yeah, I found out later. The movie Airplane? I found out later that came from a couple, of them. <laughs> a couple of them. A couple of them came from blue movies, but I found out one, one notable one was came from that, that movie. But back then, sampling was a, still a new thing. There were no laws, you know, and there was drummers and, and people getting mad because these samplers was putting them out of work and, and all that kind of stuff. So I just did what I did and I left. And I, I didn't even really like as such what he was doing. I wasn't into club music as such, you know what I mean? But I just did that. And I um, walked away, maybe a couple other keyboard parts. And I, and, and I was it. I never heard that record again until another year or so. But before I say this, 
did he have those drums down when you were when you were playing those samples, or you just played the samples and gave it to him? No, he he, he had. He had some, he had a beat down there. Okay. He did have a beat. Okay. He had the bass drum going and he had this sort of like just, just, a, just a t -t 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 off the lens drum, but he didn't have um, the way it, it was in the end. Okay. That's where he met or already knew what's his name, Vinny, Frank Melly and his wife. So I believe Vinny bought him that, that record. So he took that beat to go against what was going on, right? Wait, so he, wait let, me, let me ask the question correctly. Okay. What do you mean the record for Vaughn to make it sound like that? What record are we talking about? Castle beat uh, Forever Today and Tomorrow. And on that record, it does go. It's not the same sound. Vaughn got the reggae snare off the Lindrum and the Simmons presets off the Lindrum, and that's what he did to play the beat. Kept kept the kick that was there when I was there. And that that just just a hard hi-hat, just ch -ch 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 -ch. so that that became the, the rhythm. Of the minute you hear that sound, you know it's that record, Break for Love. And you hear do 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 in the first five seconds, yeah, you know that, yeah. So, um, hey, oh my God, that's that track. All the women go screaming, ah, they run it there, so run it, run it, run it. For some reason, yeah. Well, Vaughn Vaughn must have sold twenty thousand copies out of the trunk of his car before it even, you know, got to be um, to Sony because Vaughn was a businessman. So he was like, look, I can sell these twelve inches for four dollars each, and it's gonna cost me three hundred dollars, I think, at that time to make five hundred copies. So he was like, I'm just going to do the math. And he just kept on doing the math and doing the math. You know, he wasn't thinking about hit records or nothing. He was just thinking about making some money. So um, Vinny's wife sung the Spanish version. But the very first version was a spoken word version by Vaughn. Okay. And he just, just would just say. Please search for part two of this podcast on the platform you're watching or listening to. And please do not forget to follow us.